Good morning from the brutal capitalist dictatorship of Kuala Lumpur. I'm actually doing my cardio before my weights, as I usually do. So I have about 40 minutes to talk to you people. That's about as much time I spend on cardio. I spend 50 minutes on weights, 40 minutes on cardio. And I like to do my cardio in this car park, you see. So, I'm going to talk to you guys about the topic of today, which is the legalists are now Confucians. Or as Lenin would say, the social chauvinists are now Marxists. Let's go! Now this seems to be a painfully obvious trend that cannot be ignored. But have you noticed that revolutionary figures like Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Nelson Mandela, and even people like Jesus and Confucius, in their lifetimes they are hounded and lambasted by the powers that be. They are treated like criminals because they dare to stand up and oppose the establishment. But after their deaths, they are ironically venerated by the very same people who would have them killed, right? Yes, I'm sure you've noticed this trend by now, when revolutionary figures are basically stifled and their messages neutered in order to form some milk toast image of the do-gooder who did not really push for revolutionary change. And no body in this world more clearly exemplifies this than someone like Martin Luther King, for example. You know, Martin Luther King. We, most of you in America only know him as the, the man who said, I have a dream that all races will be treated equally, right? And the American politicians from both the Democrat and Republican camp love to pretend that that's the only thing he dreamed about, right? You know, not the abolition of capitalism, not the abolition of uh, wage slavery, not the, um, you know, the, the, the ending of American and Western imperialism, or third world countries? No, th those are inconvenient facts about him they like to leave out, you see. Because the fact of the matter is that, uh, you know, people like Martin Luther King, who enjoy immense popularity and support among the masses, then need to be stifled, neutered by the powers that be. They need to be revisionized, if that's even a word. Yes, in order to basically placate the angry masses and yet retain their power, the powers that be basically distort and contort these revolutionary figures in order to make it seem as if, you know, they would be agreeing with the powers that be today, right? Usually by taking these people's words out of context or by keeping certain inconvenient truths hidden from the people. For example, Martin Luther King is often quoted by Republicans, you know, saying shit like, oh, Martin Luther King says not to judge a man by the color of his skin. But that is the only quote they say, and I doubt most of them even believe in that quote in the first place. The only context they use it in is when, you know, they don't want white people being stereotyped or judged, right? They don't care if Asian or African American people are stereotyped or judged. No, they only use it in the context of white people, see? So basically, the reactionaries have hijacked these people and basically appropriated them as mascots of their own sinister agenda. And unfortunately, this happens to virtually every single revolutionary leader in history. Basically, 
the very same people who would have, who would have had Martin Luther King shot are now saying, I have a dream. Yes. So, yeah, it's very funny. It's, it's actually quite hilarious when you see American right-wing rugged individualist Republicans quoting Martin Luther King as if Martin Luther King would agree with them in the first place, right? Hilarious. When back in the 50s and 60s, they would have persecuted him as a communist degenerate. Mahatma Gandhi once said, I like your Christ, but I don't like your Christians. You see, your Christians are so unlike your Christ. Now, of course, Gandhi wasn't referring to Christians in the Middle East in places like Palestine, but rather to Christians, Romanized Christians in places like Europe, right? You know, who claimed to be following the Gospels of Jesus Christ, but were at the same time some of the most materialistic, individualistic, judgmental pieces of shit Gandhi ever had the misfortune of coming across, right? So that's basically what Gandhi meant when he said, I like your Christ, but you're not your Christians, because your Christians are so unlike your Christ, you see. Because you'll find that Jesus, despite being a person who basically stood with the oppressed masses, who basically condemned the private accumulation of wealth, who went around basically preaching a life of modesty, humility, and respect for people of all classes, ends up being the, uh, the poster boy of people, you see, who call themselves Christians, but are some of the worst examples of humanity, right? For example, do you honestly believe that any American Republican Bible belt, Bible thumping, um, prosperity Christian believes in the idea that if you want to be perfect, give your money, sell your stuff, or give your stuff to the poor and follow me? You honestly believe any of them <laughs> believe that? You believe any of those pastors in private jets? you know, would ever deign to ride a donkey into town, or, you know, perhaps the modern equivalent, would they dare to take a bus with the common people? Hmm? No, I doubt they would, you see, because uh, buses and planes, you see, are tubes filled with demons, to quote a very, very famous American pastor. Yes, the common masses are apparently demons, the common masses, you know, the people that Jesus came to save apparently, are demons. You believe any of those Republicans who are against universal health care and against policies that would help the poor believe Jesus when he says that Whatever you did not do for the least of thee, you did not do for me. Hell, I'm not even a Christian and I seem to know your Bible better than you do. So how did Jesus basically go from being, you know, a fighter for the downtrodden, basically a, a, a man of the people who fought for the downtrodden and stood up against injustices? How did he end up becoming the poster boy of people who support injustices, right? Like economic injustices, the unjust occupation of Palestine by Israel. How did Jesus end up becoming the poster boy of these nefarious people? Well, that's because Rome, Rome basically co-opted Christianity. Christianity was hijacked by rule, right? Ask yourself this. Why do you think that the Romans, after persecuting the Christians for centuries, treating them like, you know, like anti-establishment degenerates who are basically trying to topple the old social order 
and basically corrupt the minds of the youth, why did the Romans suddenly convert over to Christianity and adopt Christianity as their state religion, right? Do you think Emperor Constantine was any less cruel than any other Roman emperor? Of course not. So, why did Constantine suddenly start calling himself a Christian and praying to his Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Why? Well, it's because the Romans realized just how popular Jesus was. The, at least the idea of Jesus was among the masses, right? Because, you know, naturally, people who stand up against the established powers and fight for the masses is naturally going to be a popular person, right? So you can kill as many Christians as you want, you can persecute as many Christians as you want, but it doesn't change the fact that the idea of Jesus was popular, right? So, the Romans started switching tactics, right? They went from persecuting Christians to basically co-opting Christianity and basically appropriating it for their own nefarious purposes, right? And pretty soon, what they did was they basically Romanized the religion. But deep in their hearts, they never actually believed in it, right? And that is why the Catholic Church for hundreds of years has been one of the most corrupt, abominable institutions on earth which has carried out untold suffering on children by the evil, malicious acts of sexual exploitation by the priests, right? Why has the Catholic Church been allowed to get away with all this bullshit? Why? Because the Catholic Church is basically a perverted form of Christianity. Yes, I don't dislike Christianity. I don't dislike Jesus Christ. But I do dislike Romanized Christianity, which has been weaponized against downtrodden people, which has been weaponized in order to justify colonialism, which has been weaponized by the oppressors to oppress the oppressed. That is why I dislike Romanized Christianity. When the colonialists in Europe wanted to expand their empire, basically, and basically expand their capital abroad, what did they use in order to justify their, you know, their unjustifiable outward expansion? Hmm? Yes, they used Christianity. They reshaped the image of Jesus into the image of a white European man with blonde hair and blue eyes, right? And they made themselves, or rather they appointed themselves as God's chosen people in order to spread civilization to the barbarous masses of the East and Africa. But curiously, they were not really interested in spreading civilization to places like Alaska, right? Which are not known for being rich in resources, right? So Jesus, in this case, was used by the colonialists in order to justify a racial hierarchy which prioritized Europeans because Europeans were apparently not only white but more Christian and more civilized and basically anyone who was not a Christian was a barbarous backward uh, uncultured savage right and basically even if natives adopted Christianity in order to gain higher status in the eyes of the colonialist, they were never seen as equal to the colonizer because Christianity, when exported over to Asia and Africa, was never ever used, was never done with good faith. 
It had always been used as a soft power weapon by the West in order to basically advance their own goals, right? But the Christianity that's practiced by the West, as I've mentioned before, Western Christianity is nonsense, is a far cry from what Jesus would have believed in, first of all. And second of all, you know, you always hear these pastors saying stuff like, oh, how, what would you do if Jesus were to come to your house, right? Well, I'll tell you what most American Christians would do. They would slam the door in his face and let him freeze. If they didn't think he was some dangerous Middle Eastern terrorist, they would think he was some beggar. They would think he was a homeless vagrant. And they would slam the door and let him freeze. Yes, as if that's what the, you know, Jesus would have advised them to do in the first place, right? But it's not just Jesus who has suffered the indignity of being hijacked. No, Confucius, who lived 500 years before Jesus, also has been hijacked by Asian dictators for their own nefarious agenda. Yes, that's right. Neoliberal Asian dictators like Pak Chung-hee, Lee Kuan Yew, and Shinzo Abe would all describe themselves as being Confucian in some way or the other, right? They would insist that, you know, if, if anyone criticized their ways of doing things, you know, they're locking up their political opponents without trial or stifling of the press, they would say, oh, you don't understand Asian values, basically. You don't understand our Asian values because, well, Westerners, you know, they, they, they are simply different from Asians. They value freedom. They value these things like that, individual liberties. But Asians want, uh, uh, they want a job, they want security, and they don't mind trading their, their personal freedoms for security, right? But when you think about it, when you take a man like Lee Kuan Yew, for example, and you compare him to Confucius, that is basically like comparing Mitt Romney to Jesus, right? Yes, Mitt Romney is a supposedly pious Christian. Is there anything Christ-like about Mitt Romney, right? And unfortunately, because of all these Asian uh, dictators who locked up their opponents without trial, who uh, basically went around persecuting their critics and suing them to bankruptcy, Confucius has got a bad reputation. And people who have never read the Analects think that Confucius believed in authoritarianism, right? That Confucius was a defender of the establishment. That Confucius believed in basically upholding the status quo. But I will tell you that Confucius would probably have been locked up if he lived in any of these Asian dictators countries, right? First of all, Confucius was against the private accumulation of wealth, right? And yet all of these Asian neoliberal dictators who love to bandy the term Asian values all don't have a problem with the private accumulation of wealth, right? Second of all, Confucius was expelled from every single state he visited. Why? Because he was ferociously critical of the powers that be, right? These Asian dictators only say shit like, Confucius advises you to be, basically to, to think about the, the, the collective good, obey your leader, and all that shit, right? But there's a caveat to that that they don't mention, yeah? Confucius says that the relationship between a leader and the people is like that between a benevolent father and his children, right? You don't have to be filial to an abusive father in the same way you don't have to be loyal to an abusive leader, right? 
Confucius does not preach blind loyalty, but rather he preaches something, the early equivalent of the social contract in which the leader is this benevolent paternalistic or I should say paternal figure who cares about the people like a father cares about his children as, as in all the people here yeah? not just a select group of people who agree with him and the children should likewise reciprocate by cooperating with this leader but it doesn't mean that but if if basically this leader does not do his job as in he treats some children better than others particularly the children who serve his interests and basically who agree with him you don't have to be loyal to such a leader yeah you can cut off his head if you like okay so Confucius himself has been hijacked by people who are more like legalists rather than Confucians because Confucius himself did not believe in using punishment to deter crime the way these Asian neoliberal dictators do, right? Lee Kuan Yew said, for example, I, I, between being feared and being loved, right? I would rather be feared because if I'm not feared, I'm irrelevant as a leader. That is what he said. I'm not putting words in his mouth here. Yeah? Confucius would be disgusted by that because Confucius specifically, specifically said the ruler is grass, is wind and the people are grass, right? Grass bends in the direction the wind blows. So if you want your people to be good, you don't force them to be good, but you be good and they will naturally follow, right? Confucius believed that if everyone was properly educated, there would be no need for laws. Confucius was against the death penalty, right? Lee Kuan Yew was not against the death penalty. He was happy to use it against drug mules, even though drug mules are often victims of capitalism, right? Victims whose desperation is being exploited by nefarious forces. Lee Kuan Yew was happy to use the death penalty on drug mules. So how could he call himself a Confucian? When Confucianism is a philosophy of benevolence, justice and humanity. How could he call himself a Confucian? Right? No, he was a legalist. People get confused because they think Confucianism and legalism are the same things. No, Confucianism is left-wing, legalism is authoritarian and right-wing. But oftentimes, throughout history, legalists have basically called themselves Confucian in order to appeal to the people, like what the Han Dynasty emperors did, right? Not, none of the Han emperors was a Confucian. Even Liu Bang, the founder of the Han Dynasty, hated Confucians. He would actually piss into their hats, literally piss into the, the Confucian scholar's hat, right? Qi Shi Huang, the first, the, the, the emperor, the first, the, the first emperor of China, right? He had Confucian scholars killed, right? He had his books burnt because they were so dangerous to the establishment because it calls upon the establishment to hold itself accountable to the people and basically to allow the people the right to criticize the establishment, right? You know, Confucius believed. Confucius was not, was not a socialist by today's standards. But no doubt if he were born in this era, he would call himself a socialist. You know why? Because at the time of Confucius, education was only reserved for privileged people, right? Education was a way by which you could advance your status in life and the rich wanted to make sure that only they could get an education, right? So as to preserve the interests of their own classes, right? But Confucius was revolutionary in that he still gave an education to people who could not afford it, right? All they needed to do was to give him like a, a bag of dried meat or a bottle of wine and he would teach them, right? 
you know, just cheap treats every now and then. So Confucius says there should be no classes in education, right? So by the standards of his time, even though, you know, he wasn't exactly a socialist by today's standards, by the standards of his day, he was progressive. But even by the standards of his time, Confucius would not like Lee Kuan Yew. He would not like, for example, his belief that certain races are better than others. And basically, and his belief that people from the working class were dumb, slow, dumb and slow, right? He would not like his contempt for the working class. Because Lee Kuan Yew was more of a, he was basically more of a Fabian socialist than a Confucian, right? Lee Kuan Yew basically got his ideas from the law lecture halls of Cambridge, not from Confucius. And he combined that with legalism, but in actual fact, he would despise Confucius as a soft little wokeist, right? If Confucius were with us today, right? Basically, when people say Asian values, what they actually mean is neoliberal Western values with an oriental um, image, right? With an oriental mask. Or let me rephrase that. It's neoliberal Western values disguised as Asian, right? Because most of these Asian dictators who preach Asian values, who keep saying that they follow Asian values, are also big fans of capitalism, big fans of, uh, you know, corporate culture, big fans of uh, locking up dissenters, right? Especially communist dissenters, something which Confucius would not have liked. First of all, Confucius didn't even like using punishment. He preferred reforming criminals rather than punishing them, right? Second of all, Confucius never talks about dealing with dissenters with, an, with a sharp hatchet. Never. Because Confucius believes that ideas, you know, ideas, basically if someone criticizes a leader, and Confucius used to criticize leaders all the time, yeah? <clears throat> if someone criticizes a leader, that means there must be good reasons for it. And the leader needs to look into his own heart to see if there's anything that needs to be fixed. So yeah, I'm going to end my video now because, you know, my running session is over. But I just want to say that we as progressives, we as revolutionaries, really, really, really need to gatekeep our figures, our revolutionary figures, you know, in order to uphold the flame of revolutionary tradition, right? Because if we don't gatekeep these revolutionary figures, if we let just any Tom, Dick or Harry claim them for themselves, well, what can happen is that their messages can get contorted, stifled or even perverted into something that is totally different from what they originally were, right? So that is why I am particularly obsessed with policing I know it sounds ironic coming from me, but I am obsessed with policing who gets to call themselves a socialist or who gets to call themselves a Confucian and who doesn't get to call themselves a socialist or Confucian. Because ultimately, we cannot let the establishment hijack our symbols of rebellion, basically, and twist them into something they are not, right? Okay, thank you very much. Have a great day and uh, happy struggle.